Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 233, recorded on March 23rd, 2022. I'm Chris. Wes has the week off, so we're just doing a flash update, and let's get into the news. And we'll start with a follow-up that might really be connected to the most important story, in my opinion, we covered last year in Linux, and that was the University of Minnesota's hypocrite commits to the Linux kernel. We initially covered that in Linux Action News 186, and now it seems we're having something of an official response from the kernel team. The kernel's technical advisory board, TAB for short, has put together a set of guidelines for researchers who are studying how the kernel development community works or individual projects. This document that's been created by the TAB has just actually been merged into the main line of Linux 5.18, so it's actually going to be baked into the Linux kernel now. And it's really good to see this, but here's my take on the overall document. I, uh, I printed it out, if you can hear it there. And I went through this thing, and it, you know, it seems pretty reasonable. It really does kind of just sort of describe itself as a set of best practices. There's no mechanism to enforce it necessarily. It's, they're sort of appealing to the researchers' uh, goodwill, I suppose. I suppose. Um, and it, uh, it calls these researchers to disclose to a developer before a developer's project or that individual developer are targeted. It also asserts that these developers cannot just be targeted without some sort of consent. And the document outlines what is expected when a researcher submits a patch to the Linux kernel to fix whatever they might have found. And it's an extensive set of requests and asks, including in there is if you've never submitted to the Linux kernel before, maybe have somebody who has look at this first before you send it to us and waste our time. I mean, they don't say that part, but <laughs> it's kind of implied. They also take some effort to link and point to ethics and research papers that have been published before. Uh, and overall, I get it. I like it. I think it's good to see this. And I think it's great that this actually lives in the Linux kernel. So there, there really can be no missing it. I think the linchpin of this is going to be if researchers actually follow these guidelines. But clearly, if they do, then they could expect probably um, a more cordial interaction with the Linux development team than if they don't. Activists are targeting Russians with what's been dubbed as open source protest wear. And for better or for worse, this is getting some attention thanks to an MIT research review. They've taken a brief look at what they've dubbed as um, protest wear from open source, and uh, they have come to some questionable conclusions, I'd argue, but maybe they're not wrong. This is a quote from, from their review. They say, quote, no tech firm has gone this far, but around two dozen open source software projects have, and they've been spotted adding code protesting the war. According to observers tracking the protest where movement, the open source software, or I'm sorry, they say open source software is software that anyone can modify and inspect, making it more transparent, and in this case at least, more open to sabotage. Okay, they might not say it dramatically like that, but they, you know, hey, open source, it's more open to sabotage. And then they cite a couple of examples that are frankly hard to argue with. Um, I think the one that they cite that is the most damning is the recent Node IPC update. Node IPC helps you build neural networks. It's downloaded more than a million times in a week. And it had a, uh, <laughs> a quote-unquote a quote unquote, um, protest update slipped in there, I guess you could say. One that sort of described itself as a, a message of peace. But another that was supposedly hidden in there watched for the user's IP. And when it detected a Russian IP... It triggered a script that wiped the user's drives. Whatever they had permission to, it would wipe. Uh, and soon after that update was published, a GitHub post went viral claiming that the code had hit several NGOs that were documenting Russian war crimes with photos and videos. And this update designed to protest the war ended up wiping out the NGO's documents. They say that 30,000 messages and files detailing war crimes committed by Russia and the Ukrainian army and government officials were wiped out. And it's not even the first time that open source developers have sabotaged software in their own projects as a bit of a protest. In January, the author of the Colors.js, remember that? They added that infinite loop to their code that rendered any server that was running it useless until it was fixed. This is all th these are all things that the MIT research paper cites. Uh, and my take on this is that they're not wrong. Uh, I don't think it's an issue at scale, 
but it's enough of an issue that Pandora's box has now been opened. And there will be some in business and in institutions that just don't trust open source the same way. And while right now, today, it's being targeted against a group that we might disagree with, open source, as you know, is a worldwide phenomenon. And so, by my math, it's just simply inevitable that we'll find ourselves on the other side of some herd mentality one day. And these kinds of things, if they become normalized, will likely strike us. But some good news for at least you Risk 5 fans out there. Potentially great news, really. Sci-5, one of the most ambitious groups behind pushing for the Risk 5 platform, they just bagged another series of funding, $175 million in a Series F round. That's a lot of rounds of funding, but a couple of details came out in this process that overall kind of leave me feeling pretty good. Sci-5 was valued at $2.5 billion in this process. That's no joke. Um, we've seen companies like Linode recently sell for $900 million, right? So the fact that Sci-5 is valued at $2.5 billion shows you the industry thinks there's some real potential here. And overall, when you dig through it, it at least the, the picture that Sci-5 is painting, the funding situation looks pretty good because between some recent money they've raised, some of which hasn't even kicked in yet, and business revenue is actually doing pretty well too, they seem to be in good shape, at least, again, according to Sci-5. My take is that it's about time. <laughs> I mean, really, Sci-Fi has been around since 2015. Uh, they are core to the Risk-V game, and they've built a growing business out of this thing just day by day here. So it's, it's really good to see them really getting some momentum now. They say they need to hire to keep up with all of this, and this funding is going to let them do this. Get this, though. Sci-5 expects to double their 300-person staff in the next 12 to 18 months. That's how they're going to keep up with demand, and that's why they need the funding. That's amazing. It's actually happening. With Ubuntu 22.04 just around the corner, it is great to see one major change getting finished up just before next month's Jellyfish release. So, Ubuntu 22.04 LTS will now default to using GNOME on Wayland when running the NVIDIA proprietary driver. I can't believe I just put all those words into a sentence. GNOME, Wayland, on NVIDIA, default. Now, this is only going to work if you, if you have a card that can take advantage of the NVIDIA 510 series or newer driver. Um, and if you're already on an AMD or an Intel GPU, well, you're already set. Ubuntu Linux has been defaulting to GNOME on Wayland since 2104 for those of you with AMD graphics. But this is huge for NVIDIA users that use the proprietary driver. And it's the result of months of work by Red Hat, Canonical, and of course, NVIDIA. And I'm talking Zoom meetings or Blue, Blue Jeans meetings, really, in, re in reality, that you know went on and on forever, that we'll never really know the full details of how hard people worked behind the scenes to make this happen. But we do know on NVIDIA's side, they've been working to address bugs for some time. And really what's helped make all of this possible is their implementation inside their proprietary driver of the generic buffer manager. Adding that support really unlocked all this. Linode.com slash land. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and you go there to support the show. Linode is fast, reliable cloud hosting. You got to try it. It's what we've been using for the last two and a half years to build anything that's audience facing. It's fast when I say it, I mean it. They've got 40 gigabit connections coming to the hypervisors, NVMe storage for the disk, and AMD Epic processors when you want something fast. They've been doing this for nearly 19 years, and it just keeps getting better and better. In particular, I have to say their object storage has been a lifesaver. Their cloud firewalls make managing traffic simple, and their interface makes it possible for anyone on our team to deploy a server. So go try it out for yourself. See why we use Linode for everything. Go to linode.com slash land. Get $100 in 60-day credit. And of course, you support the show. Linux.ting.com. If you're sick of overpaying for cell service, go support the show and see how much you could save by going to linux.ting.com. Ting's an MVNO. That means you get access 
to the same networks as the big carriers, but with way better customer support at a lot lower of a cost. They have very simple plans. It's one of the reasons why I've been a customer since 2013. And their support is the best. That's what they get to focus on. In fact, Ting was named number one by Consumer Reports in 2021. I mean, there really is no smarter way to do mobile. You save money, you get better, simpler plans, and access to the best customer support with no contracts ever. And pretty much any phone's going to work with Ting because they support multiple networks. And it's super simple to switch. You can do it all on their website. Just get started at linux.ting.com. Go check your current phone, create an account, and pick the plan that's right for you. Ting will get you going in minutes. Get started, support the show, and save 25 bucks at linux.ting.com. Well, it's actually happened. The first alpha to get Linux on the M1 Max has shipped. The Asahi Linux team and Hector Martin announced this week that they are very excited for the public alpha to ship. It supports the current range of M1 machines with a few limitations in there. As we talked about before and prepared you for, there is no accelerated GPU support at this stage. Things like DisplayPort, Bluetooth, etc. They're not working. Some things like HDMI are hit and miss depending on the machine you're using. And at present, there is no support for the recently announced Mac Studio. None of that's too surprising. It's kind of what we expected all across the board. But now that it's actually gotten in the hands of end users, we're seeing a ton of positive reports. And for a lot of people, it seems that performance might even be better than expected. Michael Larble over at Pharonix noted this in his tests, which we'll have linked in the show notes, and he did pages and pages of tests. But one of the things that stood out to me was this. He says, quote, even with there being power and performance work still ahead for being able to make the most out of the M1, these benchmarks with the Mac Mini did genuinely exceed my expectations for this early alpha state. Running Linux on the M1 MacBooks may be a bit less ideal due to also having to worry about the battery life and cooling concerns, but at least in the case of the Mac Mini, this was a great little platform for evaluating the early state of Linux on Apple Silicon. Now here's my take, guys. I think what they've done in here is really clever. Asahi Linux has made it very simple to handle the Mac OS install on the Mac. It is designed to dual boot that, which I think is very smart in this phase, not only because Asahi Linux is not fully functional, but even long term, you're going to want that Mac install to do, I would imagine, firmware updates and things like that that Apple will only make available through their OS, of course, right? Um, and I think also, I love the choice of fully embracing the dual boot mindset, because for some people, that's going to be the utility of these machines. A lot of people got a utility and still do get utility out of dual booting Linux and Windows. It's the same scenario here. But they've also accounted for those of us that are just going to want to run Linux full time. There's essentially a minimum viable Mac option in here where the Asahi Linux installer shrinks the Mac install down and then uses the remainder, the bulk of the free space for the Linux install. Right now, Asahi Linux is really just a brilliant installer that sits on top of a slightly modified version of Arch. I tell you that so you know what you're getting into, but I also think that's really smart. Right now, this is for the domain of power users that are probably already comfortable using Arch Linux. And Arch Linux also means faster software update. So as the team upstreams driver improvements, you know, when they when they do get, when Alyssa gets GPU acceleration working or, or they get Bluetooth working, right? That's going to land upstream first, and that means it's going to come to Arch first. Sort of the same mentality, I think, that Valve had when they released the new uh, deck with Arch. Get those upstream improvements onto the hardware as fast as possible because it makes the whole system more usable. But I have seen people out there that are actually doing Nix OS. Um, all kinds of different distros, because really it's 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 using upstream bits that Asahi Linux is doing here. There's nothing proprietary to their installer. There does seem to be users discovering that some of Apple's tools are brittle in all of this. We actually had this bite, the, bite us on Linux Unplugged. The uh, project is getting reports, and we saw it ourselves, that the APFS resizers part is failing, um, probably due to some other type of file system corruption, either something that existed ahead of time, or something that the tool is introducing. There is a couple of options that we found, but if you don't 
if you don't know to expect this, it's kind of a bummer because it breaks the whole installation process <laughs> and it leaves you with what appears to be a corrupted file system. <laughs> uh, however, in our case, Disk First Aid managed to just fix it when we booted off the recovery partition. Uh, and other users have reported that they just had to do a nuke and pave, reinstall Mac OS, not ideal, I grant you, and then they could proceed. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, but we seem to have our file system problem solved on the MacBook that we are trying it on. We're going to put Linux on a MacBook Max, and we're going to give it another go on this coming Sunday's Linux Unplugged. So join us live Sunday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern at jblive.tv if you want to see how our Asahi Linux attempt goes this time. I, I, I think it's going to go better now that we fix that file system problem. It is early days, right? No doubt about it. You got to acknowledge it. The value isn't there. There's absolutely no reason at this point to go buy a Mac with the intention of running Linux. That would be a silly thing to do. Don't do what Chris did <laughs> and some of his friends. But I see a near future here where I'm going to have a headless, low-power home Linux box running on M1 hardware in my future. This could really bring my home hosting game to, to a whole new level. I'm always going for the best performance per watt, because for large portions of the year, my home runs off of solar energy. I have no grid hookup at all. And so it really makes a difference how much power something draws over the long haul. And so the M1 hardware has just been extremely attractive to me from a home server, low power, high performance standpoint. But there's just no way I was going to do it with Mac OS as a server. So to see Asahi Linux working on this, I'm extremely excited. GPU acceleration is still kind of far off in the distance, but that's clearly like the next major milestone along with some of the other hardware enablement, but it feels like we're on track here. And now that the public's getting their hands on it, it's going to accelerate the involvement. It may even accelerate people joining the Patreon and supporting the project. We'll have to see. We'll keep an eye on this and everything else in the world of free software and open source. So don't miss a single episode. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And we'd love your feedback. You can either send us a boost on a new podcast app that supports boosts or go to the contact page, old school, linuxactionnews.com slash contact. And let's hang out. I wanted to let you know we do have a live stream coming up on March 31st at 4 p.m. in Seattle, 7 p.m. in New York, 11 p.m. London time. Again, that's March 31st. It's an ask me anything. If you've been having questions, you got thoughts, concerns, ideas, I don't know, let me know. Come to the live stream and let's chat. I'll also have the mobile room going. And I'm going to help people get Matrix set up because I know the onboarding can be a bit rough. But our Matrix community is awesome. Decentralized chat is the future, and I want to help people get on board. And speaking of decentralized futures, I'm also giving away some Bitcoin to help you get started with boosts and value for value. So go get a new podcast app, newpodcastapps.com. I like Fountain. So you're going to need something that has a lightning wallet. And then I'll be giving away some Bitcoin to help you get started because I think it is the future of independent media and free software. Again, that's live March 31st, 4 p.m. in Seattle, 7 p.m. in New York, 11 p.m. London. I'd love to see you there. Of course, we'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks so much for joining us. And that's all the news for this week.